Okay. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Ivan Oberon's Money Matters. This is Thursday, September 25th, and we are going live right now. Tonight, I um, got to say, I'm, I'm really excited about uh, this webinar tonight. I put a lot of time and uh, thought into this to give you guys as much value as I possibly can. And, and I can promise you, regardless of where you are, as far as a real estate investor or in this business, if you've done a bunch of flips, if you if you hold rentals, if you're brand new, doesn't matter. You you will get value out of, out of tonight, and we're going to be going over the eight steps to protecting your rentals, rehabs, va and vacant properties that will save you thousands. And and I literally mean thousands because I can I can tell you from personal experience, these things I've experienced many of many of the things that uh, uh, if if I had taken some of these steps, if I had known when I was first starting out, when I was getting into the business, you know, I would I would have I would have prevented myself from. Uh, the the aggravation and the pain and the and the cost that that some of these you know painful lessons uh, that I had to learn, uh, so so that's really always the the goal, right? That's the that's the that's one of the things that motivates us as as entrepreneurs and as somebody who likes to give back and 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 you know as as far as as far as being giving and caring and loving towards our, our you know, people that we come in contact with and being driven and enthusiastic and focused as entrepreneurs, one of the things is always to give back from our experiences, right? Because our experiences are really the, the sum of, of what makes us valuable. You know, the more that we learn, the more that we that we experience and, and the things that we learn through mistakes and the things that we learn through victories, they don't mean anything if we don't go out there and share them with other people and add value to their lives and add value to their potential careers and 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 you know their their activities. So I am Ivan Oberon. I will be your host tonight. We're gonna go for uh, probably a good hour, and I want to encourage you guys to participate. I want to encourage you to to get a a, a pen and a piece of paper because I, I I guarantee there's gonna be some things you're gonna want to jot down and take notes on. Um, I encourage you to get some water. Just be prepared. And for those of you listening on uh, on the podcast, uh, I encourage you to do, to do the same thing. And for those of you who don't know, I, I am the exclusive in insurance consultant for the American Association of Private Lenders. Uh, you can look them up. They're they're an organization uh, of about 400 members thus far, and and the majority of those members are private and hard money lenders. So they're the people that you want to know that you want to connect with as a rehabber or somebody who who needs to leverage and take loans uh, in order to to do projects to do either fix and flips or or even if you're looking to do, to do rentals um and need to fix up your your distressed properties and hold them as rentals you you want to know those people so i'm privileged to to be their exclusive insurance consultant so that i can educate them i can help educate their borrowers especially uh, to help them uh, be able to be protected as well. So that's uh, that's that's what I'm that's what I'm doing. That's what I spend most of my focus on. I've uh, been in the business for over eleven years, and uh, right now my my sole focus and sole purpose is to serve my fellow real estate investors. And we're going to get into all all that kind of stuff throughout this presentation. And this is why I put this presentation together is to be able to serve you guys in the real estate investment community, regardless of where you are. If you want to contact me, make sure you take my email down. It's Ivan at nreinsurance.com. And we're going to come back to some of these things. Um, but, you know, the, the reality is, is that through my career in rehabbing houses and flipping houses and looking to do cash flow properties. And I, I just finished uh, my third one in, in the last three months uh, for one of my investors. We, we, did, we did a turnkey uh, rental for him in, in Indianapolis. Um, you know, there, there's certain things that come up. There are certain things that, that we want to know so that we can work better with our contractors so that we can work better with our property managers so that we can work better just with our with our own teams and understand what it is that that we need to do to protect ourselves what is it that we need to do to prevent certain mistakes and certain things from happening because there there are some some things that are that are going to be pretty common sense right but sometimes people don't think about them and the broad scope of what we're going to cover tonight is going to apply to all those strategies right whether you're a landlord holding rentals, whether you're a fix and flip guy doing rehabs, or whether you maybe you have some vacant properties. Because I, I have colleagues and partners who sometimes they'll buy a, a block of properties and it takes a while 
to get to all of them, right? And sometimes they're, they're just sitting vacant for a while, but you still own them. You still have the liability that's that's, that's uh, basically assessed to those properties as, as the owner. And you got to understand how to mitigate your losses and your costs long term so that you can be profitable. So we're going to go ahead and, and, and dive right in. But I have, I have a question for you before we get started. Okay. And I expect you guys to participate. Okay. So the question is, which one of you or how many of you find insurance interesting? All right, come on, raise your hands. How many of you find insurance interesting? How many, how many of you just get excited about insurance? All right? Not, not, not many of you, you know, and, and, oh, there's one. Yes. All right. See, Kim, Kim, Kim's excited about insurance and you know, I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to commend her for that because I was, uh, I was in Dallas uh, a few months ago or a couple of months ago. And I, and I was uh, at a Eddie speed, uh, uh, conference. It was, it was Eddie speed summer summit. And for those of you who don't know who Eddie speed is, he's, he's one of the authorities in the note investing, uh, in space. So, uh, definitely connect with him, but I was, I was, I was there and I was up on stage. I was speaking to a, a room of probably about 180 people. Uh, and I asked the same question, you know, how many of you get excited about insurance? And I got three hands between two people. So one person was really, really excited about insurance, right? She raised, she raised both her hands. And then, and then we had one other person and, and, you know, quite frankly, it, there's not a whole lot to be excited about when it comes to insurance, but when you understand insurance, and you understand the value of insurance and having the right type of insurance and what it can do to save you money and protect you long term, then yes, you know there, there's definitely something interesting and exciting about insurance. Um, but I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna bore you guys too much with this. Um, let's see. After we have one comment already. After 30 years in the business, I still find it interesting, especially since hardly anyone else knows it. Well, that's that's a good comment, you know, and and that's and that's one of my goals and. I know you guys are here to, to find out the eight steps for protecting your rentals, rehabs, and vacant properties so you can save thousands down the road. And so I won't, I won't segue and go into the weeds too much, um, but just to, to kind of go along with, with Fred's comment, you know, after 30 years in the business, I still find it interesting, especially since hardly anyone else knows it. That is why I'm so passionate about this right now, especially I wasn't, I was never that passionate about it in my previous insurance life. But now that I'm focusing specifically on real estate investors and the value that I can add to them, and because I'm a real estate investor myself, now I get excited about it and hardly anybody else knows it. So I want to be that authority. I want to be the, the, the face and the voice and the name of insurance for real estate investors. So anyway, so here, here we are. And, you know, thank you. Thank you so much, Kim, for being honest and, and raising your hand. And, and uh, you know, Fred still finds it interesting. So that's good. So we're, we're going to go ahead and dive right in. Um, I, I presume that you guys are ready. You're, you're excited. We're going to keep engaged. And, I, and as I promise you guys, I'm going to keep it fun and entertaining so that you don't tune out. You don't you don't go to sleep. And, and I, I, I will leave any technical insurance terms out of it. OK, that's, that's my promise to you. Um, all right. So number one. The first thing that we want to do, here's our first tip. Like I said, it's, it's, it's not rocket science. Some of these things you're going to know, some of these things are going to be pretty common sense and some of these things uh, you may not have ever thought of. Okay, so prevent thieves and squatters is number one. Now, why? Why, why, why is that important? All right, well, I got a, got a friend of mine here that tuned in and unmuted himself. So... Here, here's the thing, okay, and and some of these things here here's some of here's some of the experience. Um, people, believe it or not, will go into your vacant properties or, or properties that are under rehab, and they will steal your kitchen. Okay, the thieves we're talking about, right? The, the squatters will leave your stuff in there because they because they <laughs> because they want to go ahead and and use it, but they will steal your, they will steal a kitchen. Okay, they'll take your can their, your countertops, your cabinets. They'll 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 go and they'll they'll scrap the stuff for pennies if they have to, just just so that they can. I mean, I hate I hate to say this, but I mean, most of them is just so they can get their next fix, or even or even you know just just something to eat in some cases. But they'll go they'll go in there and they'll they'll steal your kitchens. Um, this photo also is from one of my properties. Okay, that that's a that's a breaker panel. They will steal your 
wires. So all your all your electric wires, um, they will go in there and they'll steal them because why? For the copper, right? Because they can go and they can they can sell copper and they can they can get a few bucks. And here's here's a here's a story of how how clever and how I mean resourceful some of these guys uh, can be. Uh, this this was this was a property that I had vacant for a little while. Uh, they they broke into it and they took everything. I have another property that I had sitting there for a little while. Again, the story that we talked about or that I mentioned earlier, where you know sometimes you buy some properties and you're not sure what you're going to do with all of them, you know, right away. And so some of them might sit there for a little bit, and some people might be a little bit more resourceful. Well, I'm working on a, on a project right now where we're, I'm doing another turnkey rental uh, for uh, one of my investors. And one of the first things that we do when once we contract and we get the thing going, we had to turn on utilities, right? So we order utilities and I, and I, I knew that somebody had gone in and stripped all the wiring from this house. What I didn't know was how advanced these guys were and they, they stole the load wires and ripped everything out, the meter and everything gone from the weatherhead. And I mean... To their own peril, right? Because I mean, we're talking dangerous stuff now. When you when you got to when you're going to the weatherhead and stealing the load wires and doing all this kind of stuff, but you know, those are those are costs that you're going to incur from from thieves. And you know, sometimes those those thieves are the squatters. In those cases, um, they will they will go and they'll they'll steal your really the guts of the furnace. You know, most most times the the furnace itself isn't going to get stolen, but the guts of the furnace. Again, they're they're going for whatever they can scrap, whatever they can get a little bit of money from. They will take your toilets. <laughs> okay? Yeah, you know, sometimes not the squatters, uh but since the water and everything isn't working, they don't really care. Sometimes they'll take your toilets too because again, they can recycle those things, they can get they can get a little money for them. So it's important to prevent those thieves and the squatters in whatever way possible. We're going to, we're going to talk about those ways. Now, so what are some of the ways that you can prevent those things? Uh, one of the easiest and best ways to do it is through an alarm system, right? I have uh, alarm systems and, and, and I'll, this is, this is another one of the lessons that I learned the hard way as well. Okay. And my partner Scott's probably on the line here and you know, we, we, we differ in how we feel about these things. I started off flipping houses. I never installed alarm systems uh, on any of my properties, especially here, here, the ones here in California. When I went to the Midwest and to Indianapolis, I was like, you know what? I, I don't know. I talked to some other people out there that were doing business out there. And they're like, well, I usually don't install alarm systems and, and whatnot. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to bite the bullet and just, or I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to play the odds and, and I'm not going to get an alarm system. I don't want to spend the money. You know, I was, I was doing multiple projects. Um, at one point I bought about 12 properties in a month. And you know, well, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go with the alarm systems. Well, I don't know what was going on. If there was a racket going on or something was happening, but all of a sudden, I started having issues. And as soon as I started having issues, like my air conditioning units getting stolen, I started installing alarm systems. You know, centrally monitored alarm systems. They're fairly inexpensive to to uh, to install, and I'm paying on average about 30 bucks a month quarterly. I pay it quarterly. So I'm paying about $90 every quarter. Um, and it, you got central monitoring. And, you know, before I went this route, I, I tried, I tried, uh, armed patrol. There's, I found this company that was, um, um, you know, basically retired, uh, cops and, and military and they did, they did patrolling. Um, I tried putting a dog in a house and, and Scott and I laugh about this some, sometimes because, you know, we've, we've put, uh, um, you know, things like Rottweilers, Dobermans and, and things like that in a house. And, and uh, you know, sometimes those aren't the smartest things, but, but you, sometimes you get, you know, it takes you a while to learn, right? Sometimes it takes you, you gotta, you gotta go through the hard stuff sometimes um, and it makes some mistakes before you realize, you know what, it's, it's sometimes it's just as, as simple as putting in an alarm. And and here's the difference. Now, an alarm is not is not really going to stop somebody from potentially breaking into your property, although it can be a deterrent. But it will prevent the theft in most cases, and it will and it will at least reduce the amount of damage that you incur. Because in property, I had a property I didn't have an alarm system on that one yet. They broke in, and of course, there was damage to the door jam, the door. And then they went to steal my appliances that I had in there. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But they took the refrigerator. And fortunately, in this case, uh, a neighbor took notice 
And by the time they they had the refrigerator out and they had it in their truck and stuff like that, the neighbors took notice, sp- spooked the, the thieves, and they took off with my refrigerator. But when we went in there, and I say we, I mean my team, because uh, because I wasn't there, uh, the the um, the dishwasher, the oven, you know, the, the basically the range, the microwave, and the water heater were all in the living room, and my wood floors were damaged because they were dragging all that stuff across to the front door or to the side door. And so that's that kind of damage, you know, not, now I have, you know, my, my lines were cut in my water here because I use PEX plumbing. I don't use copper, uh, especially in the, in the Midwest. So they, they, they cut them um, because copper is what thieves go after. Uh, they, they'd cut all that stuff. And so I had all, they had all these extra damages. And if you had had an alarm system or if I had had an alarm system and it had, you know, the, the, the noise had gone off and all these different things, now I, will, I would have only had to deal with the damage to the door which would have been minimal, right? So alarm systems, I mean, they're, they're, they're fairly inexpensive. Um, Scott and I were just communicating and uh, we're, we're about to put on a, a have, install an alarm system on our property in, uh, in Atlanta, uh, which, is, which is finishing right now. And we're hoping, obviously, uh, we already have three people interested before, before we even have the project re- uh, done. Uh, and we're hoping it doesn't sit for very long, but if it's gonna sit there for a little bit, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna go ahead and, and put an alarm system. It's pretty, pretty cheap. All right. So what's the next thing you can do to prevent thieves and vandals? Uh, board up and secure your vacant properties, even even your properties that are under rehab. OK, and this is this is kind of what it looks like. It's pretty efficient. And as a matter of fact, um, I'm about to do this again right now. And going back to what I got done telling you guys about the, the people that stole my, the wiring on this particular property that, that we're just starting the rehab on for the turnkey rental. Well, guess what? I called to turn on the utilities and because this was going on, we need to install uh, the, the electrical and then we need to have everything basically run and ready to go and inspected and signed off on for the city to then, or not the city, the basically the power company out there to uh, order power to be turned back on, order the new meter to be installed and, and everything else. And now it's going to take them two, it's going to take two crews, two different crews to do this. And they're telling me five to seven days. So what's the problem here? Now I have a property that's under rehab where my plumbing's already done, the demo's already done. Uh, you know, I need to do some framing, and the electrical is in there. And this is a property in a high traffic area that's already been stolen. All the all the electrical's already been ripped out, and we're at a stopping point because we don't have any power. So the 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 power company's telling me five to seven days. Well, now I'm in a conundrum, right? I'm I'm going. Well, what do I do now? What do I do for those five to seven days when I have I have the 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 alarm system panel installed? but I have no power and I can't get any power until the city comes out there, but I couldn't get the city to come out there until I did all my wiring. thus leaving myself exposed to be, uh, you know, the victim of crime again and theft. So what did I tell my contractor to do today? Tomorrow morning, you go out there and you secure that property, you board everything up and you send me the change order for that particular activity. So this is essentially what it would look like. It's a, it's a great deterrent. Now, if somebody really, 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 really wants to get into any house anywhere, I don't care what it is, can they get in? Of course they can. doesn't matter what kind of alarm system you have. It doesn't matter what kind of gates you have. I mean, I can, I can go, we, anybody can go break into a gated community and break into one of those houses with alarms and security syst- systems and video cameras and all that kind of stuff, right? Anybody can do it if they really want to. But the, 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 the thing is prevention. The thing is, what's going to what's going to dissuade somebody? And my my grandma had this saying, you know, you, you basically um, it was a different language; it doesn't translate right. But but it's basically help keep the honest people honest, right? Which is why you don't leave your windows down in your car or in your purse in the seat. A normal person wouldn't do that, but if you leave the window down and your purse in the seat, a normal person might all of a sudden become a dishonest person. So this this is just another one of those things where you can secure your property, you put a lock on the, on the thing, you, you, you bolt it from the inside, you, you do the job right. And it's, and it's not that expensive. Okay. Depending on the size of the house and the number of entry points that you got, that you got to get, get secured, you're going to be spending a couple, you know, two, 300 bucks to do it. And it's worth it because I know that if they go and they steal all my, all my wiring again, I'm going to, I'm going to be out another couple, you know, two, three thousand dollars. Okay. So it's worth it. Now, this particular person um, on this project got kind of creative, right? <laughs> they put they put they boarded up the house 
and they even spray painted on there no copper <laughs> I, thought, I thought that was kind of creative it was, was kind of like uh it's kind of like those um like like in those restaurants or or fast food places or 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 the or the uh brinks trucks right you know the driver doesn't carry or or you know no more than a hundred dollars or driver doesn't carry more than twenty dollars or so, something like that right to to basically discourage people to to break into it uh, we we're we're boarding this thing up like crazy but you know what there's nothing of value in here anyway so uh anyway i got i was kind of amused by it um number two <laughs> all right any questions on that pretty pretty self-explanatory pretty basic um scott if you, even even though you're pretending to be pete you know if you have any anything to add you you, you know just feel free feel free but uh, um anyway i'm excuse me while i take a drink all right number two Number two of the eight things that are going to save you thousands of dollars. Number one, I could have stopped at number one and you would have already saved thousands and thousands of dollars. Okay. And I can say that confidently because I've been there and I know what it has cost me. Um, because sometimes, you know, you get lackadaisical about certain things. Ah, well, you know, it's not, it's not, I'm going to, I'm going to, it's only going to be a few days. All, all they need is a few hours. Okay. All they need is just a few hours. I closed on a property recently and I, I, I fought with the bank because the buyer, well, the bank's buyer or the buyer's bank, I'm sorry, wanted me to install the ACE unit before they closed. And I fought with them and I fought with them and I fought with them. I didn't want to do it because I knew the risk. And I usually, I usually don't install AC units, exterior AC units and different, and different things, you know, and we're talking in, in like, C neighborhoods. Okay. B to, B minus the C neighborhoods. I'm not talking A neighborhoods and, you know, doing all this kind of stuff. You don't have to worry about that so much, but in C neighborhoods where you have a lot of, a lot of activity and a lot of good, and a lot of good deals and where a lot of people are doing business because, because the business is there, right? The deals are there. You have to consider certain things. And I told them, no, I don't want to do it. So finally they forced me to do it. They wouldn't close unless I installed it before. So I said, okay, when are you closing? You're gonna, we're going to close on Friday. Okay, fine. I had, the, I had the unit installed Thursday. Guess what happened? They didn't close Friday. They pushed it to Monday. Guess what happened? That unit was stolen before closing on Monday. So they don't need a lot of time. All right. So, so don't, you know, don't make the mistake of thinking, well, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm just going to, I'm just going to chance it. You know, sometimes you can spend just a couple of hundred bucks to save yourself thousands of dollars. So again, getting back on track, number two, Keep your yard and property well maintained. Okay, there's a lot of there's a lot of properties that look like this. I've seen them, and depending on where you are, and this is this is kind of outrageous, right? How crazy this is because you know there, there's there's a thing called code enforcement in most cities, and uh, you know Indianapolis, for example. It, I mean, they are just they are on top of it. I don't know if they pay these people in code enforcement like high salaries or what they do, but they don't let you get away with anything for, for more than a couple of days. So this would, this would never happen there. Uh, well, you know, unless, unless they, they were fining you and stuff like that. And they'll, they'll even take care of it. You know, they'll, they'll take care of, of your, your $20 every other week maintenance. They'll go ahead and take care of it. If you don't let, if you let it go and charge you $350 for it. So, you know, here, here's, here's the issue, you know, there's, there's certain things, but Going back to the thieves and squatters, when you have a property that's not well maintained, one of the things that that non well maintained property provides is it gives it gives thieves and squatters a place to hide. Get, you know they they can they can sneak in there. They they can they can be kind of unobstructed unobstruct, from whatever it is that they're going to do. And man, nobody nobody will even see them doing anything. And if there's if there's a storm or if there's something happening, and there's winds and stuff like that, now you have these these trees and this brush and these all these other things that are going to damage the property as well. So it doesn't even need to be uh, vandals. The, just the 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 nature itself will damage your property and and cause more undue exp uh, expense for you. So and, and not only that, you'll get a property that is obviously unoccupied. And you, one of the things that you want to try to do is do what you can, if you can, to make the property look occupied. 
because that's going to be less of a of a attraction. It's going to be a deterrent, right, to to thieves when there's somebody who's who's occupying the house. And it's crazy, but that's why I wanted to have the AC unit installed after somebody moves in. The appliance is installed after somebody moves in, because man, it's it's weird when somebody moves in there and there's activity there. It, it, it just kind of, you know, thieves are no longer attracted to that and vandals are typically less attracted to those things. So your yard and your, you know, needs to look more like this. Even if it's, even if it's vacant, it doesn't matter. Your yard needs to be well kept for all the reasons. You know, thieves are going to have a lot more difficult time breaking in or stealing something on the outside. If there's a, if there's a storm or, or something happening, you're going to have things beaten up against the house. Your, 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 the branches of your trees are going to be cut well above the roof line and away from the roof line to prevent further damage. Um, so that's, those are the, the steps that you want to take. Make sure it's well-maintained. It doesn't cost a lot of money. It, it just really doesn't. And depending on where you are and the time of year that you're in, you know, those costs can be even less, but I literally pay $20 every other week to maintain my properties in an, in an area that by the way, gets a lot of rain and a lot of heat during the spring and the summer. And, and, those, and I mean, those, those weeds and the grass and those things, they grow like crazy. And I'm still only spending $20 every other week. And it gives, it gives a well-maintained appearance. It keeps code enforcement off my back and everything is good to go. All right. So trees, trees. What happens if you don't maintain your trees? Okay. This is part of the yard. But too many people, I see way too many people, and this is one thing that insurance companies have a big problem with. And if they inspect, you know, they're gonna they're gonna hammer you or, or deny coverage, or they're gonna tell you you need to do this. If you have a tree that is a bucking your property, or there's a there's a branch that's touching it, or nearby, or or you know something that's that's potentially obvious that something bad can happen, they're gonna tell you you need to take care of it. And you know what? It's to your benefit. And insurance companies are in the bu- are not in the business of paying claims. Okay, let's just be real. Insurance companies are in the business of making money, and so the benefit to you because they have that business model is that they're going to give you recommendations of what you should do to prevent losses. Because ultimately, we all get insurance in case something happens, right? But all of us, the insurance company included, all of us hope and pray and wish that we never have to use it, right? Because it's important that we have the right coverage at the right time. But none of us want to go through that hassle of having to use it. So taking the proper loss prevention tips, like maintaining your yard and making sure your trees... I mean, look at this tree. This tree is obviously... Oops. Away from the property, right? But it obviously had a branch that was right here. Going over the going over the property, and if and it broke off, it was probably a windstorm or something that happened, and and you can see damage all over the roof, all throughout here. I mean, it it, it messed up the fascia over here. I mean, it was it was it was pretty major. So now, when they could have gone and spent who knows maybe a few hundred dollars to get this tree trimmed, now they're gonna now they're gonna be spending probably upwards of ten or fifteen thousand dollars in repairs. So make sure that you take care of your trees. Unless, of course, you, you have an awesome tree house. Now, if you have an awesome tree house, invite me over because, you know, I've, I've always wanted to, it was one of my things as a kid, you know, I like to always like climbing trees and doing different things. And, and, and if you have an awesome tree house, just, just, just invite me over. We'll hang out. We'll be friends and stuff like that. And, and I won't even tell you to, to cut your tree back. But if you have just a, a normal house, make sure that you're maintaining your yard and you take special attention or take uh, you know, uh, make, give special attention to the trees. All right. Everybody good with me? All right. Raise your hand if you thought that was an awesome tree house. Come on. Interact. Anybody. Engage. The more you engage, the more you're going to retain, the more information you're going to... All right, Kim. Man, I'm going to have to give Kim a prize at the end of this because she's, she's, she's participating. All right. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was a pretty awesome tree house. The funny thing is my I went to school with a with uh and one of my buddies who graduated, he he ended up going into he he was always an artist and um went into drafting and and uh architectural design and stuff like that. Well, he designed this this tree house 
I uh, had made the blueprints, made the sketches, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and is, is in the process of, of building one. So I think that's pretty cool. Uh, but number three, tricks to create an illusion. So what if, what if you don't necessarily want to spend a bunch of money? What if you, um, you know, aren't, aren't sure Maybe you want to wait off or hold off for a little bit and then, and not take some of those measures. Well, one of the things that you can do and something that I did do, uh, in the beginning, uh, I mean, I remember, I remember <laughs> we'll get into this, but I'll tell you some stories, uh, tricks to create an illusion. What kind of illusion are we talking about? Well, one of the first things that I did before I got alarm systems, I did go out and I bought these yard signs for alarm systems and window stickers. And I had them shipped uh, to my properties in the Midwest. And so I had, a, I had a, you know, these, these yard signs and I had these stickers and all these different things. And, and those things are good. Okay, that's, that's, that's one thing you can do to create an illusion. And, and it is a little bit of a deterrent. The, the problem with these things is that if somebody does get bold, and for example, these, this is something that these will do, is sometimes they'll throw a rock through a window from a distance. And if no alarm goes off, then they know that it's just a hoax, right? It's just an illusion. And so some of these guys, I mean, I'm telling you, some of these guys, that's, that's kind of what they do for a living, right? Is they're, is they're thieves. And so they'll, they'll do stuff like that. Sometimes they'll just, just, to, just to test it out. And if the alarm goes off, great. You know, they'll leave that house alone and then you have a broken window. But if it doesn't go off, then they'll make plans to go back into that house and take care of business. So again, there's, there's a tip, but there's also, there's the, there's the fallback. There's, there's what could happen. All right. How about beware of dog signs? <laughs> you know, we've, we've put actual dogs in properties. What about just a sign to create an illusion? And, uh, I'll, 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 uh, I'll give one of you, well, not Scott excluded if, if he, since I think he's on here. Uh, yes, he is. Scott has joined us. It's no longer, it's no longer Pete. All right. So, um, if any of, if any of you can tell me who that person is in that picture, holding that beware of the dog sign, um, I'll give you, I'll give you some kind of special prize and uh, I, I don't know what it is, but I'll figure it out. Um, I have, I have lots of cool things that I can, that I can offer you. So I'll give, I'll give you guys till, till, um, I don't know the next, next 20 seconds. If, if one of you can type in that gentleman's name, I will give you a special prize. But I think that's an, that's an awesome picture. It's actually from, um, our, uh, convention of the AAPL in Kansas, Kansas city is the American association of private lenders. Uh, the mayor of Kansas City uh, actually uh, was the the keynote speaker of that event. Uh, we got to to introduce him. We were we were um, uh, guest hosts of that event, and it was it was a lot of fun. Um, and it's it is not Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> nice nice try though. Nice try. Uh, at least at least uh, I like that you guys are engaging and keeping it fun. So, but I'll, I'll tell you who that is in, in just a little bit, but an amazing, amazing, amazing man. And, and maybe I shouldn't start talking about him because then we'll get totally off, off subject and we'll go an hour and a half in this webinar. Now, what about your, your um, lock boxes? Well, make sure that you keep your lock boxes in inconspicuous places. So what does that mean? It means don't put them on your front door, okay? Most houses have a back door and a, and a side door where, where you can have your lock boxes somewhere else because what does a lock box indicate? It insinuates that the property is vacant and it's going to be a calling card for anybody that wants to break in. And guess what? Lock boxes can, can be broken into. They can be cut off doors. They can be pried open. They can all these kind of things. So if you have a lock box in your front doors and that's, that's most realtors MO, you got to train your realtors, guys. Okay. You know, you, you, we depend on our realtors and our contractors, but we got to make sure that we're inspecting what we expect. Okay. We're trusting, but verifying. We got to, we got to tell them what we want done and educate them on why it's the right thing to do. Right. So make sure that your lock boxes are, are in either rear doors or side doors, not the most conspicuous place, the front door. All right. The next thing is going to be, um, you know, be selective with the pictures that you take. Okay. This is another, this is another one of my properties. 
Uh, this this property was in Spring Valley, um, which is in San Diego County. And I only and I only put this this picture up here because I got I got I got nice appliances. I got some nice stainless steel appliances in there. I noticed that notice there's no refrigerator because I don't provide refrigerators. But you gotta be selective in the pictures that you take when you're when you're listing properties or when you're doing things with properties because that's gonna be a calling card. And believe it or not, thieves look on Craigslist. They look on Realtor.com. They look on Zillow. They look they look for all these online listing syndications to see what. What, what, what's a good property? I mean, they're 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 getting smarter too, right? They're they're getting lazier and lazier. They don't they don't necessarily walk the neighborhoods uh, just looking for a place to go. Some of these that are, that are a little bit more advanced will actually go online if they see a bunch of nice stainless steel appliances, or you know, never mind about Viking and Wolf appliances and that kind of thing. It's a calling card for which property they should target. So be selective, you know. And and I struggle with this because I want my listings to look good. I want my properties to look good and, you know, a nice set of appliances and a nice set of things is going to attract buyers, but it's also going to attract thieves and vandals. So you got to, you got to, you got to know where you are, what neighborhoods you're in, what, you know, is, is it, is it a C neighborhood? Is it a D neighborhood? Is it a B neighborhood? Is it an A neighborhood? And take the proper precautions. Okay. And then last but not least, Keep your mailboxes empty. Okay. And depending on, on where you are and you know how long that property has been sitting there, where you got it from, et cetera, it may still be receiving mail. This is the same thing when you go on vacation, right? I mean, I have my friends when I when I go on vacation for more than about four or five days, I have I have either a, a friend or a relative come by. And I mean, I don't even have to tell my dad. I mean, my dad, if you guys knew my dad, uh, I mean, he he's he's just the prevention wizard right when it comes to life um and and i mean i can i can do a six hour webinar on my dad but um you know he'll come by and he'll just just on his own he'll come by every couple of days and bring my mail in because my parents have keys to my house so he'll bring my mail in i don't even have to tell him anything but make sure you have somebody if, if the property's still receiving mail for any reason you don't have mail piling up because again that is another sign that the property is either vacant or that somebody's not there and that somebody hasn't been there for a while or isn't going to be there for a while. And it gives people more of an incentive to put your property on their hit list, if that makes sense. All right. Hang on a second. What, what do I got here? No, that's no, no. Well, you, you did cheat and, and Abby, um, was, was going back to, to the picture, uh, Justin, um, Abby helped in that picture, but I, I didn't even get the picture from Abby. And of course, uh, that gentleman's name is not Abby McLaughlin. <laughs> uh, quick question. What about staging to look occupied in the house? Well, yes, you know, <clears throat> but here, here's the thing, Mavis, you're not going to stage a vacant property unless you've already done the rehab and stuff like that. If you have a vacant property or, or a rental that you're, that you're waiting to get tenanted and leased. And, and by the way, you know, if, if, if you, if you have a, a, a property that you're looking to get tenanted and turn to turnkey invest investment, you should, you should be able to get those things done within two or three weeks. Okay. If, if you're not doing that, you're, you're using the wrong property manager or you're in the wrong market. Um, but as far as staging, yes, yeah, staging can help. Absolutely. It can help sell your property. Most people think about, yeah, we're going to use this to sell our, help sell our property, but it can help it look occupied. If somebody is um, walking by or driving by, um, I usually have the the porch uh, lights on, right? That helps it look occupied. You turn you turn your lights on, um, and of course you have to factor that into your soft costs of uh, your electricity and stuff like that. Um, and I and I heard uh, I heard somebody unmute themselves. Did you want to say something? Did you talking to me? I don't know. Am I? <laughs> hey, you know, I, I great webinar. You got a bunch of enthusiasm tonight, buddy. It sounds good. Hey, one thing too is going back on the appliances. You know, and you and I have gone back and forth on this debate. And I, I like to keep the appliances out of the, out of the property and give a credit back to the person who is buying the buying the uh, buying the property. So I usually, you know, put in a, a twenty five hundred or three thousand dollars appliance package 
Now, where you run into problems with that is if it's an FHA loan that they have yeah. to have all the appliances in. Right. And, and that's kind of what we're and, – and we run into that also in um, Atlanta. We have uh, final inspection. And you're breaking so, up really bad. I don't know oh, why. I don't know either. Um, we have the final inspection out there, and they're requiring the AC unit to be in, and they're also requiring the microwave hood and the, um, the vent for the, the stove, which would be the microwave hood. So we put the microwave in, and it's got the hood on the top of that, on the yeah. bottom of it, and then um, a dishwasher. So right. just check with your local, your local areas and everything else and, and what you have to do. So that's what I wanted to say. Okay. Thank you. I think we I think we understood most of that, right, guys? <laughs> All right. So absolutely good good advice. And and yeah, that's that's an issue that we run into sometimes. You know, there's there's sometimes things that come up that you cannot control as far as what somebody's requiring. And if you're targeting an FHA buyers in those price points, then you're gonna have to understand what those what those things are. But one thing that I do is I wait until somebody tells me that I have to do it. Okay, same thing with with uh, the, here's another little real estate investment tip, and this is just me. I I also wait until somebody forces me to send the earnest money deposit. Now, depending on the state that you're in, yeah, sometimes it's three you know seven uh, three days that you got right. But depending on how quickly you're going to close, maybe you're going to close in five days, maybe you're going to close in ten days, maybe you're going to close in fourteen days. I will wait, and I will not send that money in until somebody absolutely is practically forcing me to do it. Same thing, same thing with installing appliances or installing those AC units on the, on the exterior of, uh, of a home. Um, when you know that that's, that's a peril, that's a risk that you have, right? You wait until the last minute. You wait until somebody tells you to do it. You don't just go out there and, and throw it out there and, and, and put your money out there if you, can, if you can help it. All right, so number four, winterize your properties. So I'm going to go into a lot of detail here because there, there's people that don't understand this. Maybe they've never dealt with it before. Maybe they're not in a, in a market. Maybe they don't live in a market where they actually have weather like me and like Scott. You know, rain doesn't count. Um, and yeah, we're having a hard time getting that here, even here with our, with our crazy drought conditions right now. But um, when, you, when you're investing in some of, some of the, the more... Um, the other markets in the, in the country, the Midwest and different places where they actually have weather. Uh, and, and even some places actually in Vegas and, and uh, some parts of California where, where it gets cold, you got to winterize your properties. And this isn't just the vacant properties that you're waiting to see. This isn't, this isn't just your rehabs. These, these are going to be your, your properties that are done and, and uh, waiting to get a tenant in them or done waiting to sell them. And they're completely done. They're beautiful. You have things turned on because they're done, right? You're waiting for a buyer to come in and they, and they got to go in. They got to they gotta fool with it. And any of you who, who've ever, well, whether you've bought a house or not, any, anybody who's ever moved into a place, I don't know if this is just me. Okay. I'm gonna, here, here's another, another one of those, these times where you're going to participate and raise your hand again. Okay. I've bought, I've bought, um, I've, I've moved once and rented a house. And then from there, I have bought two uh, of my own personal dwellings. And one of the things that I do when I go through a house, I don't know why, I always turn on the shower. Always. Because water, you know, water pressure in the shower and whatever, I don't know why, but I always turn on the shower. So if, if you've ever done that, raise your hand, be honest. Okay, nobody can see your response but me. Be honest. How many of you go and anytime you've gone into a house you're considering moving into, you got to turn on the shower. Okay, we got one person. All right, so either either the rest of you are lying or, or, or you're just too scared to raise your hand. All right, so anyway, that's, that's just what I do, right? And so you're going you're gonna to have these things on. And so it's important to winterize your properties because, I mean, you don't even have to be in the Midwest and, and, and some of these crazy places to get into freezing temperatures. Why is it important? These are some of the things that can happen. Again, this this might freak you out, but this is actually a living room. You can tell people were living here. Got so cold, pipes burst. They were away. They didn't whatever. You got icicles from the ceiling. You got all kinds of crazy ice in the in the from the floor. 
Here's one that that um, I, mean, I thought this was crazy, right? It's uh, your 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 all your cars are frozen solid, like it's crazy. Pipe burst in the garage, and and I'm I'm, I'm going to try to do the best I can to describe some of this for our our friends listening in the podcast, but um, it, it's 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 so important to winterize your properties. So what's the right way to go about it? I'm going to go ahead and assume and presume that maybe most of you, if not at least half of you, don't know how to do this right. And again, you do not want to rely on somebody else to say, hey, go winterize my property, Mr. Contractor, Mr. Realtor, Mr. Whoever, right? You need to know how to do it yourself so that you can instruct somebody else and you know what to expect when somebody else is doing it. All right, so the number one thing, the first thing right now, turn the water off at the curb. Not at your angle stops, at the curb. Okay, you got to make sure that there's no more water flowing into the property at all. Okay, because there's all kinds of things that can happen. Make sense? Okay, after you turn your water off at the curb, you're going to drain your pipes. So you want to open up your faucets, you want to open up your showers, you want to open up your hose bibs, you want to open all that stuff up to drain all the pressure out of those pipes. You with me? Okay. And I'm sorry, guys, we're going to, we're going to go, we're going to more, go more than an hour tonight. Okay. <laughs> drain your water heater. That's something that 99% of people don't think about. Yeah. Drain your water heater too. And it's very easy. Okay, I'm not saying that you're going to do this yourself, but you got to know how to do it and where to do it. Drain your water heater. There's there's a there's a little valve at the bottom. You you can stick a uh, install a hose there. Run the hose outside of your garage or outside of your house or wherever your water heater is, and you can you can open it up, and it'll drain. And hopefully you can you can use it to water your plants and you know recycle that water somehow. Um, and if you're, you know, especially if you're in some of our places where we're, where we're having such drought, I mean, you'll, you'll get, you'll get fined for that really bad if you're wasting water. So, I mean, use it, you know, collect the water somehow so you can redistribute it to, to, to your plants and different things, but drain your water heater. Now, once your water heater is drained, what you want to do is prevent damage to the water heater. So you want to make sure that you turn the breaker off if it's an electric water heater or you shut. And, and what I mean by that is turn the, the whatever breaker in your panel controls the water heater. Okay. Now that the water heater itself has a breaker, let me just clarify that to keep it simple, stupid, right? Or shut off the gas valve if it's a gas water heater because you don't want your water heater accidentally kicking on when there's no water in the tank and burning itself out. And now you need to repair that water heater. Okay. Want to drain your toilet tanks and bowls. That's another thing that a lot of people don't think about. But your toilet tanks and your bowls can and will crack or just completely break. They just will. So make sure that you drain those things too. Now what you want to do is you want to take a compressor and blow out those lines. It's easy to do. You know, you not now that you already have all all your all your faucets and showers and all that kind of stuff open. You want you want to blow blow out the excess water if you can, okay? Just to be extra safe. Okay, again, these are things that most people don't think about and don't know. You have to know the right and proper ways to do this so that you can tell other people because they will cut corners on you unless you tell them exactly how you want it done, and then verify it, and then inspect what you expect. So you have you have to know these things. Now, here's another big one, and my good buddy, Scott Travis, kind of lit the light on this one for me, um, you know, because he, he, he does that. He, he, he does, he, he was a swimming pool contractor, so, you know, he's, he's out there in the backyards and the irrigation stuff, so he's smart like that, right? But you, you do get a rain, uh, I'm sorry, drain your irrigation systems. Because you will have geysers coming out of your, your lawn and you will have irrigation systems break and bust just the same way as you'll have copper pipes. Okay, so think about it. Most irrigation systems are PVC. Most plumbing systems um, are going to be copper. And if copper pipes can break and bust at the seams and at the welds and uh, 
you know, I mean, how, how much easier is, or is uh, PVC going to break? So you got to drain your irrigation system so same, in the same way. All right, I'm going to take a pause and uh, look at some of the comments. Let's pick that saw. Okay, do you recommend putting in a refrigerator? Other people say buyers like to pick their own refrigerator. What are your thoughts? Okay, um, maybe I'm catching this comment a little bit late, but yeah, I, I usually, if if it's if it's a, a nice rehab, like a, a, a nice high end. Um, retail flip, I will put a refrigerator in. That will be part of my appliance package. Okay. If it's, if it's a more, more of a moderate flip, I will not put in a refrigerator. If it's a turnkey rental, I will not put in a refrigerator. Okay. Most tenants are going to have their own refrigerators. You know, and depending on the price points and the type of neighborhood that you're in, um, they're not going to necessarily care about matching their appliance to what you have. Okay. So, so it just depends. Now the turnkey flips that we're or the turnkey rentals that we're that we're doing, the average price points uh, to another to an, another investor is going to be between forty thousand and eighty thousand dollars. So it's nothing it's nothing super sexy, right? But it cash flows. So you got to think about what kind of tenant you're going to have in that house. You got to think about what kind of buyer you're going to have for that house, what neighborhood, what demographic you're you're basically appealing to. And that's how you made the decision as far as what type of appliances to put in and whether or not you put it in a fridge. Hope that makes sense. All right, we got another comment from a uh, contribution from Boyd. Drain the J drains or put antifreeze in the drain. Thank you, Boyd. We're gonna we will get to it, I promise you. But that's a very that's very good advice. And you know, I hope you guys don't mind that I didn't put pictures in for all this kind of stuff. I mean you have no idea how many hours I spent on this presentation already. If I had to find pictures for every single one of these things, I, I was just like, you know what? I'm going to give you guys some awesome bullet points so you can take notes and you can and you can use your imagination on these. Um, but yes, we're, we're, we're going to get to that. Make sure you point antifreeze in your toilets and your sinks and your bathtubs and your showers and even your dishwashers, right? Antifreeze. You, wanna, you, you wouldn't think about putting antifreeze in, in a dishwasher. You just wouldn't. But it's important to do, and it, and it will uh, save you some money. You got cheap, cheap fix. Uh, keep keep heat on in houses if possible. By about fifty five degrees, will do the trick. Now I say if possible, because there's going to be certain instances and circumstances where it's not going to be possible. You know, you're not going to have utilities turned on at this house. You're not going to have um, power or gas. Well, of course, that's, that's utilities, duh. That's the same thing I'm talking about. But sometimes it's not going to be possible or make sense to have your, your, you know, maybe you don't even have a furnace in there, right? Even if even if you had utilities turned on already, it may not make sense. But if possible, and that's what you're going to do, keep them turned on at that at that pace. <laughs> that's that's uh, that brings me to my next point. Of course, prevention is key. Okay, prevention is key. So take those things seriously. I mean, ser costs can exceed the tens of thousands of dollars. And in, in some cases, in some severe cases, and I know this from experience, I've seen this, especially because of the industry that, I, that, I, that I'm in, not just real estate investing, but the insurance side for real estate investors, that, I mean, in, in really severe cases, the properties may have to be demolished due to extreme freeze and water damage. Sometimes people don't know what's happening. Sometimes people... Are, are I mean, they don't go to the properties for weeks or months sometimes, depending on what's going on. Now, that's not to say that's going to be you, but if you get to that level where you're, where you're buying large portfolios at a time, because that's, that's the only thing that makes sense anymore in this industry, you know, you get to that level where you have the, the, the cash to do so, there's going to be times when you might not be going by some of these properties. And of course, this, this is an extreme picture, okay, right? I'm making a point. Okay, we got we got we got stuff growing, and you know, you know, I mean, it's it's been a while, but this was obviously a property that was severely water damaged. Something happened, and it got severely water damaged. It was it was flooded at one point, and prevention is key. And it doesn't have to be this 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 extreme of a picture. It can be it can be something small that happens 
just one little pipe bursting and you're not paying attention for it to it for a while and i've seen to where houses have to be demolished so prevention is key okay we're talking now now we're talking about how many like tens of thousands of dollars or more savings in this tip right all right scott what do you got to say buddy hey buddy can you hear me better now or no i can hear you okay right now Okay, good. I'm going to be right where I'm at. Hey, one thing that um, that you've done great on, one thing that you might have bypassed, and it's happened that I've purchased a house this way, is swamp coolers. Now, it, it sounds kind of odd, but there is times when we get freezing in the desert, and what happened is there was a snowbird that had a house out in the desert, a uh, swamp cooler on the, on the roof, a quarter inch, a quarter inch feed water mm -hmm. line that fed that fed the swamp cooler mm -hmm. it went it's a single story ho house with a basement the basement had six feet of water in it oh so and and then what happened is it got into black mold so i'm mm -hmm. just saying you know even the littlest thing anything that feeds your house with water any any anything that has to do with water in your house make sure it's turned off and that and these people didn't quite winterize their house but they turned everything off but they forgot the quarter inch water feed that went to the swamp cooler on the seat on the roof so yeah. just remember anything that has water in it winterize it there you go buddy well what, what, what you mentioned uh actually ties into michael's comment uh, scott travis's indoor pool right that was that was that was the <laughs> that was the basement you know mm -hmm. yeah exactly a six foot pool i mean you don't even get that in some of these resorts anymore so all right thank you so much scott thank you michael for being funny and uh, pr just remember, guys, prevention is key. All right. Next step, number five. We've kind of touched on this already. You want to make sure you cage your AC units. Okay. That is a properly caged AC unit. Now, <clears throat> what you want to make sure you do with your AC units and cages, and I, and I was, I was going to put some pictures up, but I decided to just talk to you about it. There are different ways to do this. In a proper way and an improper way and this is the most proper way and what i mean by this is that this ac or this cage actually fits this ac unit there's a lot of times when people just put this big cage around this ac unit and it's and it's not sug it's not snug it's not fit to that ac unit the specs are way off and the problem with that is that it, it gives thieves more of a leverage point to get in there and pry things and, and, and work it and, and bust that AC unit loose and bust the cage loose. So you want to make sure that you have a cage that fits. And there, there are some people uh, like Copperhead Cages, for example. Uh, they're, they're out of Kansas City, uh, but they do custom cages for AC units. And there's, there's people like them out there that will, that will make the cages to the specific AC unit specifications, and you're gonna you're gonna spend anywhere between uh, three hundred to four hundred four hundred fifty dollars to cage your AC unit. On top of the cost, of course, of having the AC unit installed, but it's worth it. And all you gotta do is just factor into your budget. Okay, you want to make sure that you factor those things in. Now, what happens if you don't, or if you do it improperly, or you know, if you just have a string of bad luck? People will come and they'll steal these things. Here's here's a guy that was that was, I mean, he was having a good night, right? <laughs> Until he got stopped by the cops, he was he was going around stealing AC units, and I had um, I had three properties that I bought on the same street. You know, here I am thinking that I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna do my job to really revitalize this uh, this block and help this community. Right. And so I bought these three houses. I'm going to revitalize all three houses. It's going to improve property values and do all these different things. Well, the contractor didn't listen to me or it wasn't the contractor. Really, it was it was the project manager didn't listen to me. And he had the AC units installed. And two of the pro two of the properties on that street were right next to each other. So I bought them both. And then the other property was a huge property. Um, it was it was about, I don't know, six or seven eight houses down and uh we we're converting that one it was it was a duplex we're converting it into a, a 3600 square foot uh single family but anyway so the the two houses that i had next to each other did everything had everything done they installed the ac units i didn't know that he did that against 
my wishes until a week later when he told me that both AC units were stolen. Both AC units were caged and yet both AC units were stolen. So sometimes weird things happen. You got to make sure that you, 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 know, you take every precaution possible, but understand that sometimes weird things happen. And when you don't cage your AC units, you're more likely to end up like the, like the victims of that guy in the bottom. Okay. Number six, and I know I could have spent more time on there, but it really wouldn't have made sense because I'm just, you know, I, ha I have a certain pain in my heart when it comes to that. So, so I got to make sure to keep you guys from making those same mistakes. So th the next thing, number six, perform reasonably regular maintenance inspections. Okay. Reasonably regular just means, you know, you don't, you don't got to show up every week, but make sure you don't go two or three years without doing an inspection for maintenance okay especially if you're a, if you're a landlord of course is what we're talking about if you have rental properties make sure you inspect your water heaters okay you have you have your water heaters inspected make sure that they go on top and install or check the fittings and where the the inlets and outlets are okay because what what ends up happening i mean you have a whole bunch of issues that can happen one of them, the thing that people think about, of course, is water damage from the water here going. Well, what people don't understand is that the steam that can potentially be released from a water heater at the temperatures that it comes out of there can severely scald or even kill somebody, depending on the room that it's in. And, you know, you have this steam and they, they breathe it in. It can kill your tenants. Okay. It can severely injure a person. And I know I'm, I'm speaking in this kind of like, no, it's never happened to me. Right. But just thinking about it, cause it can happen. And that's a liability claim and a liability loss that you do not want to get involved in. So never mind about your property damage. Okay. And I talk about this all the time as, a, as an insurance guy. Liability is what wipes people out. So you got to think of both sides. Pr pr protect your property from damage, but you got to protect yourself from those liability claims and potential liability losses. Okay. Water heaters can be deadly. All right. So make sure you have them inspected. Now, what about your furnaces? Same thing. Furnaces can catch, can, can create fires and they have created fires. Make sure you have your furnaces inspected on a regular ma uh, maintenance schedule. Okay, now obviously you're going to do this when you have an inspection done and for maintenance, you're going to have them all done at the same time. Okay, dishwashers. It's important to make sure that the dishwashers are inspected too. Why? Now you don't have, you don't have like, you know, potential death that can happen from a dishwasher, but water damage. Of course, a dishwasher can malfunction. Something can happen, water damage. What's a big one? Ice makers. Oh my gosh. The more I've seen more water damage claims from ice makers than probably anything else. Yeah, I had, I had a client whose wife was a gourmet chef. Okay. And she liked blanching things. And Scott, Scott uh, can come back on here and explain to you the process of what it means to properly blanch a vegetable. Okay. But she had to have this specific ice maker that made this these specific ice cubes that had this specific, you know, have I said specific enough times? But I mean, it just drove me crazy because, you know, they had to be a certain size and a certain thickness and a certain volume, a certain thing, because, because only that type of ice, ice cube could be used to properly blanch vegetables. And what happened? The, that, that, that same ice maker... <laughs> I have to catch myself there. It, it failed multiple times. And she and they filed three different water claims from this specific ice maker that kept failing. And of course, we're, you know, now, now the insurance company is going after the manufacturer and all these different things because it was because it, it was, you know, kind of kind of a faulty design. But it damaged the kitchen every single time. And they had you know these wood floors, they had all these different things. I mean, and so you know we're, we're talking tens of thousands of dollars in damage over a silly ice maker. So that's why I wanted to spend more time on that because that, from my personal experience, that has been the worst. Is make sure make sure you have them inspected. Okay, guys, that's, that's your regular maintenance interval. For those of you who have rentals or want to have rentals, you gotta be taking notes on this kind of stuff because this is the kind of stuff that's gonna save you thousands of dollars.
and you can't even quantify the amount of aggravation that it's going to save you. Okay. Number seven, select an appropriate deductible on your insurance policy. Now, what most people don't, don't, um, kind of factor is the fact that your deductible is a loss. Your premium is a loss. Okay, the premium that you're paying for insurance is an expense. It's a loss. You got to look at it as, as, as that. And then you got to set your deductible appropriate to make sure that it offsets your premium in the proper way, especially if you have multiple properties. But even if you don't, the advice that I like to give is you got to you got to be in the in the bigger mindset, right? It doesn't matter if you're just starting in real estate investing. It doesn't matter if you if, if you only have one property. Do you have do you want to stay there? No, I don't think so. I know I didn't. You want to be able to scale. You want to be able to get to the to, to the next level. You want to own 150 properties. Right, so you can have the freedom and the lifestyle that you want that and, and desire for yourself and for your family and to leave a legacy, all those kinds of things. You, so you got to think in those terms. And here's a good rule of thumb. You think about what's the minimum amount of loss that you would really want to go through the hassle and aggravation and time and filing, and filing a claim. I mean, if you have a $300 loss, are you going to file a claim? Pff, no. If you have a $500 loss, you're going to file a claim. Not likely. If you have a $1,500 loss, are you going to file a claim? Really? Really? No, probably not. You know what I mean? If you have a two or $3,000 loss, okay, yeah. Now, now it's now it's starting to bend, you know, bend my finances a little bit, right? You know, when we, when we, in loss prevention, we talk about things, we call it bother, bend, or break. Those are, those are the three things. If it's going to bother you, whatever, you self-insure for that. You keep that. If it's going to bend you, well, now you're going to think about it. Are you going to transfer that to the insurance company or are you going to retain it? If it's a bend, you can go either way. You got to take all the, all the facts into account and figure out what you want to do. In many cases, you're still going to, you're, you're going to still retain that loss. That's going to be a bend. Now it's the break. It's the losses that are going to break that you want to transfer the insurance company. So here's a good rule of thumb. Again, what's the minimum loss? that you would file a claim for and go through all that pain and aggravation and, and you know have a loss history in your clue report and all that kind of stuff. If it's $2,000, if it's $2,500, you double it. And now your deductible is $3,000 or $5,000, right? Whatever the minimum amount is, you double it. And that's a good rule of thumb. Because remember, the insurance companies are in the business of making money. And somehow people are under the impression that if they carry a lower deductible, it makes them feel more secure in case something happens. The problem is, is that now you're losing more. You're making the insurance companies more money. And yes, I write insurance. Yes, I get paid off a premium. But you know what? I'm not an insurance company. I'm a consumer just like you guys. I don't want the insurance companies making more money off of me than they have to. And I don't want the insurance companies making more money off of you than they have to. So you got to be smart about this. Quit thinking that you have to carry these little, tiny, little, low deductibles because all you're doing is you're giving the insurance company more money every single month. I don't carry a deductible that's less than $3,000. Just to let you guys know on my properties. Now, my auto insurance... That's completely different, but that's not, now we're not talking real estate investing. <laughs> My auto insurance, I have a perfect record. I have a long driving history. I have all these different things and it, and it costs, you know, it costed me just, just like $18 a month to drop my deductible. So that's, that's totally different. Okay. But when you're talking about property and investing, rehabbing properties, vacant properties, rental properties, you got to get smart if you want to be able to scale. Because if you have one property, sure. Maybe the difference in premium isn't that big. But again, you got to think big. How do you want to be able to scale your property? Do you want to own one property for the rest of your life? No. You want to own five or 10 or 50 or 150. And once you multiply that times carrying a lower deductible, which is going to carry, make you carry 
increased premiums, that's a significant loss. And that's how I view it. You got to view it, that premium that you're paying as a loss. And if there's something you can do about that premium with your deductible, then by all means do it. Now, it doesn't mean that sometimes you're not, you're not going to pay a little bit more premium for the right coverage, but it means that you can use your deductible as a tool to make sure that you're, you're getting a good balance. All right, now, number eight, you're all, you've all been waiting for this, right? Number eight, <laughs> work with a qualified consultant with access to the right program and products. Right now, you guys had to see that coming, right? No, you probably didn't. I was pretty sly about it. So that's me. Now we're getting now we're getting into, you know, I, I don't ever sell anything on any of my webinars. There's never a 997 pitch at the end. It's all content, it's all value, it's all information. <clears throat> but I want to make sure that you guys know what I do. And that's what I do. That's why I know all these tips and tricks, because I'm a real estate investor and I'm also the right kind of insurance consultant. So we do have a specific program for you guys, for any of you who are investing in fix and flips, who have potentially vacant properties, which anybody who has, who's working on fix and flips obviously is gonna have vacant properties, or who has rentals. And let me just go over, if I may, over some of the benefits that you will gain from our program, because our program is created by real estate investors for real estate investors exclusively and specifically. We don't do anything else and there's specific needs that real estate investors have that most insurance agents don't have a clue about. And I know this also from personal experience because I was one of those guys. I was a real estate or I was a, a, an insurance guy for many years before I got into real estate investing. I didn't have a clue. And even when I got into my own business, I didn't have access to the right products and the right services and the right structure. So I struggled for a while to find that. But then I finally, I finally found it. And two years later, Almost three years later, I decided to, to, how can I add value to my fellow real estate investors? I'm going to combine my two skill sets, real estate investing and insurance. Now that I know that I have access to the right products, I've been using them for years myself. So this is, this is what it is. It's for all your insurance needs. Even if you're, uh, you know, investing in notes, it doesn't matter. Apart apartments, it doesn't matter. We have the products for you. We're going to insure properties that are either occupied, vacant, under renovation, really under any stage of renovation. We include them all in the same schedule or policy with no location limits. Now, this is significant. Okay, you got to understand this, especially if you want to know how to be able to scale. Okay, we, we insure all of our products, all of our policies on all of our properties on the same schedule, whether they're vacant, under renovation, rented, it doesn't matter what stage, they're on the same schedule in a monthly reporting form, which makes it easy for you to understand what all your properties are, what they're doing, what each specific coverage is that's assigned to those properties, and what the cost is every single month for those properties. And we have no location limits. Most companies out there stop you at 10, and then you have to go find a different carrier. Okay, that's, 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 that's crazy. Why would I want to do that? You got to go find a different carrier with different rates, with a different agent, build a different relationship. They're not, they're not going to understand your overall needs. No. So we wanted to address that. So we did. Now we can ensure multiple owners controlling and, and, or, or controlling entities under one schedule, including trusts and LLCs. Why is this significant? Well, because most insurance companies don't do that. Okay, they they <laughs> they they start freaking out when you say that you own it in a trust. They'll start freaking out when you say, "Okay, well, I got, you know, we got coast to coast and uh, um, owns this one along with with uh, IND Group, along with Scott Travis, extraordinaire pool guy and contractor extraordinaire who likes to blanch vegetables LLC." And now you have three or four different investors in one deal. And insurance companies are going to be like, ooh, no, 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 we don't, no. We understand that. That's part of the business. You're going to go into business with other people. You're going to do JV deals. You're going to have to leverage funds and resources with other people from time to time. Many in some, in some cases, that might be your primary business model. So we can do that. 
Liability only coverage is available. Again, that's important because maybe you don't want to insure the, the full property because you don't think maybe you bought a, 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 you know, a pool of five properties or more. And you know, maybe one of them is just a throwaway, but you got a good enough deal that that's, that's, that you wanted to get that. But if anything happens at that, that location until you divulge yourself from it, you're still liable. So if a squatter or somebody hurts themselves, man, somebody can still sue you because you're the owner. So we can, but we can throw liability only on there so that you, you have a, a lower premium. Uh, we do have coverage available in all 50 states. So again, what's the benefit of that? You don't have to go to a different agent every single time. If you want to go into a different market, you're not restricted by that. And that's big. I'm telling you from somebody who's built relationships after relationships, after relationships and having to deal with different, in, different underwriters and different things, man, you just want to go to one, one person and develop that relationship and keep it for years because they understand you. You don't have to explain yourself to them every single time and what your needs are. So we are licensed in all 50 states and we can even write business in Canada. And there are some people that I, that I know that are here in the U.S. that are investing in Canada and we can do that. Now, if you live in Canada and you're listening to this webinar right now or this podcast, we cannot insure your, pro your projects unless you have a U.S. address yet. And we're working on getting licensed in Canada so that we can ensure people who live in Canada and are investing in Canada. But if you're in the U.S. and you're doing projects in Canada, we can do that as well. Now, death and vandalism coverage is available. And I'm going through these kind of quick now because I want to get through these and uh, we're over an hour already. And I respect your guys' time, but I think this is important. This is valuable for you guys to understand, okay? Theft and vandalism coverage is available. This is, this is probably, if I mean, in my opinion, and from my experience, this is your number one risk owning properties. Okay, because this more so now, if there's a fire and something happens, is that loss going to be greater? Yes. But the likelihood of somebody vandalizing or, 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 or robbing something from your house or stealing something from your house or stripping your, your, your appliances or your wiring or something, that's, you're more likely to have that happen. And we have full theft coverage. Most companies out there exclude it completely or significantly limit it. Okay, you got to understand that. We have the ability to escrow premium payments. So if, you know, kind of like what, what we do when, with our rehabs, we throw six months of premium in it at a time and then they escrow those premiums and then they apply the, that, that premium uh, on a monthly basis and basically reduce that payment amount. So say we throw, say we throw $1,000 at it and uh, that's, that's for six months. Each month, a sixth of that $1,000 goes down. We don't have to worry about it, think about it. And, and it, you know, there's no minimum earned premiums either, which means that if we finish the property faster, or the project faster, and we and we did a six month payment, now we can get those the, the the remaining balance back. And this last week, I was looking at a at a at a gentleman's project that had a what ended up being a fifty percent minimum earned premium on his six month policy, and the premiums were were a lot higher also. So so for six months. He was, he had a 50% minimum earned premium. So I, I, we sent him the proposal. The coverage was significantly better. The ease of use, everything else was, was significantly better, but because he had taken coverage out three days ago and he had a 50% minimum earned premium in order for him to switch his insurance on that particular project, it would have cost him $1,900 in minimum because he had a minimum earned premium which means that when, as soon as you take the policy out, you might have a 25%, a 50%, whatever the percentage is, maybe it's a 10% minimum earned premium. So regardless of what you do, you have to, you're, you're locked into throwing that premium at it. So what, what did he do? He's like, all right, well, obviously it doesn't make sense for me to switch. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the chance on this one, but my next project, which is already in the works, I'm insuring with you guys. And we have no minimum earned premiums. That's powerful. Okay. Overseas investors are welcome. Some of you may be overseas. Some of you may not be. Our radio show is downloaded in over 70 countries. It may be, it's very likely that, that some of you listening to the podcast are overseas. We appreciate that. We want you to come and be able to invest in U.S. real estate. Okay. So we will welcome you. Most insurance companies will not. Same to approve of insurance. Of course, that's important. 
when you're trying to close a loan, um, this is this is very valuable for our um, uh, private uh, lender clients, obviously. And then you as a as a borrower of those is very important, especially if you're in a time crunch. No co-insurance penalties. Now this this is also a significant a significant thing, and and again, I'm, man. I can go into the, this in very much detail without taking too much time. I'll just say that co-insurance penalty means that if the insurance company says that the, the property is worth, say, let's just say $100,000, okay, just for ease of math, property is worth $100,000. They say, based on their calculations, that you have to insure this property for $100,000. Now, you may know that the property may not take that much to build. You may know that it may not take that much to rebuild. Your, your your total liability or your investment might only be $40,000. But they're saying by their calculations and market value that this property is needs to be insured for $100,000. The way the co-insurance co works, and I understand this because I did a lot of homeowners policies. I mean, and some of these, a lot of these companies have a 100% co-insurance requirement. Which means that if you don't insure that policy, that property for $100,000 and there's a loss, they're going to hit you with a co insurance penalty. What does that mean? Keeping it simple. So even Scott can understand it. May, may, taking it further, even so even Pete can understand it, right? So, so let's just say that you choose because you know that's only going to take you $60,000 to actually rebuild that entire property. You choose that you're going to insure that for $60,000. Now, according to the insurance company, you're underinsured for 40 per, by 40%. So if a loss happens, they're going to come, they're going to assess that, and they're going to hit you with a 40% coinsurance penalty if they have a 100% coinsurance requirement. Now, most companies out there have an, between an 80 and 100% coinsurance requirement. Right, which means that you have to be insured at least, you know, eighty thousand dollars, up to a hundred thousand dollars. With that example, right? So when a loss happens, let's just say that again, your co-insurance requirements are one hundred percent insured to value, and you only insured to sixty thousand, so you're underinsured by forty thousand dollars or forty percent. You have a ten thousand dollar loss. What does that mean? Anybody? Raise your hand if you know what that means. I'm going to tell you. I'm not even going to give you a chance. It's going to take too long. That means that they're going to give you sixty thousand dollars. I'm sorry, six thousand dollars, because they're going to hit you with a forty percent coinsurance penalty, because you're insured forty percent of value. We do not have any coinsurance penalties because we understand that sometimes, as investors, we need to insure these properties for a lesser amount for what we know our total investment is. So if we paid $20,000 for it and the rehab is $30,000 and we're into it for $50,000 or let's just, let's just call it $60,000 all in, including soft costs, that's our investment. Why would we want to insure it for $100,000 and pay the extra premium? That's how the insurance companies get you, right? They have, a, they have an 80 or 90 or 100% co-insurance requirement and now you have to pay the extra premium on that extra coverage that you're buying. We don't play that game because we're investors. So we have no coinsurance penalties. If you want to insure your property for $40,000, you can do that. Now we create a benefit and a coverage package specific to your needs every time. We don't have an off the shelf program as most because we have we own our own captive insurance company. We've already bought the coverage we're just redistributing it and we're having it um, uh, reinsured with other carriers. We have agreed value coverage. That talk, that's the same thing as, as basically what we're talking about with co-insurance. It's agreed value. Whatever you say you want, we'll insure it. But there's just a couple of things you have to keep in mind. You have to insure for a minimum of $45 a square foot to avoid that co-insurance penalty. Okay, now you guys, I'll let you guys do the math. Okay, that's not that's not a lot. That's more than enough for any of your properties. And we're going to get into something else here in a minute. But ease of use, 
flexibility and cost effectiveness of a master policy. We talked earlier, you can ensure all your locations on the same schedule and that gives you economies of scale. So the more properties you insure, the less money you're gonna pay per property. And you don't have to start coverage and cancel coverage every time you swap out a policy or you swap out a, a property and paying new down payments, going through cancellation processes. Now you can do everything on the fly. Okay, you add it, you delete it. Add it, you delete it. Pretty easy. Or let's just say it's vacant. You need a certain type of coverage. Now it's under renovation. You need a, certain, a different type of coverage. Now it's under, now you, now you decide to go ahead and rent it out. It's a different type of coverage. We can do all those coverage shifts on the fly. Whereas every other company out there has to cancel that vacant policy, start a new one. Has to cancel that renovation policy, start a new one. Has to cancel that that renter's policy and do something else. Okay, that's why. That's cumbersome. It's expensive. Now, 65% a square foot gets you full replacement cost coverage as well. Do the math on that again. $65 a square foot of insurance is not a lot. Okay, in most cases, you're probably gonna want to insure for at least $75 to $80 a square foot. The key here is that you get full flexibility. All right, and that's it. You hung with me. You hung with me. So in order to find out more, go to cdcria.com forward slash insurance. I encourage every single one of you, go there right now. There's nothing to buy, okay? It's just information. Go there right now, cdcria.com forward slash insurance. It's just gonna tell you a little bit more about me, a little bit more about what we do and how we can help you whether right now or in the future. And there's even a, a, a proposal link because we want to make sure we keep everything easy for you. You can click on it. You can put in the property address, your information, the coverage request, you know, all your contact information, your basic stuff, and it'll send in a, a request for a proposal. If you have any other questions or you want to get a hold of me or you want you have comments, email me, Ivan at nreinsurance.com. And I'm happy to help you. And if you found value in this presentation, just tell your friends. You know, that's the, that's, that's, that's the least I can ask from you. Hopefully, I've earned the right to ask you. Tell your friends. Talk about this, this uh, webinar on, on social media. I've sh I shared the, the thing online. I'll, you, you, can, you can share it if you've seen it. If we're not friends on Facebook yet, make sure you friend me. Go to cdasuria.com forward slash connect. And you can find all my contact information there. Um, and <clears throat> now I'd like to open it up, man, I think I've talked a lot. <laughs> now I'd like to open it up for, uh, comments or questions. Please, I'll, I'll raise your hand. I'll unmute you and, uh, we can, we can, uh, we can get you on live on the recording or type in your question or comment in the, in the bar, but that's it. You guys made it. Now, now, now tell me, okay, honestly, I'm going to ask this from you guys too. Type it in or, or raise your hand and answer. If any of you have, have dealt with insurance stuff before or presentations or, or you know, people talking about it, was this better than that? Were you more entertained? I mean, I, I mean this is just for my own personal edification, obviously, because, because I want to make sure that I, that, I, that I do provide value and do it in a way that's entertaining and engaging because it's not the most, most um, you know, interesting subject, but it's so important. It's so important. All right, one comment, I had no idea about insurance, great value. Thank you so much, thank you so much. Yes, I learned some, some a lot to process. No, yeah, well, you know, I wonder, it's always better to give more than less, right? All right, guys, thank you so much. Definitely uh, excellent presentation. Insurance is too mysterious. To pass over, absolutely, absolutely. You gotta, you gotta, you guys gotta know the right people because this is this is different. Okay, that's that's what it gets me excited because this is so much different than insurance as a whole, right? If you're if you're a renter, you're renter insurance. If you're a homeowner, homeowner insurance. If you're you know, have a car, auto insurance. There's so much different than that stuff. It's way more exciting because this is this is your business. This is your future. This is your legacy. This is your financial freedom that we're talking about insuring here. And that's why I get excited about it. Uh, it was more informative. Never knew this stuff. Thanks a million. Thank you so much, Kim. Thank you. All right. 
Let's see. How do you compare to the covered investor? How do you compare to the covered investor? Okay. I'm not sure I understand what that means. How do I compare to the covered investor? Now, every investor is going to have some kind of insurance coverage. What most investors don't know is that they have, whether or not they have the right insurance or not. Oh, the covered investor. It's an insurance company. Well, I don't, you know, Gabe, uh, Gabriel, I hope I pronounced your name right. Um, Gabe, Gabrielle, maybe. Um, I've never heard of them. Oh, it's a brokerage. Well, I'd like to look into them. I, so I can't tell you how I compare. All I can recommend is you go to c2cria.com forward slash insurance and you'll see some of the differentiators. I just I just spoke about some of them here at the, at the end. Um, so you tell me if you're familiar with them. Um, you can tell me how, how we compare, but I can guarantee you there's nobody doing what we do on the scale that we do it in all 50 states. Uh, presently, we just just on just on the single family rental side, we insure almost 40,000 locations nationwide and service over 6,000 individual investors. And that's just on the the single family rental. That doesn't include all the all the rehab investors that we have, all the apartment investors that we have, the note investors. So, I mean, plus our all of our principal agency um, company principals are tenured real estate investors uh, for multiple generations. So um, that's the best way I can answer that only because I don't, I don't, I've never heard of them. I don't know who they are. I have a contract for deed with a tenant and they can't get insurance. Okay. Well, Mavis, we don't have, uh, we don't do tenant or uh, insurance for tenants. That'd be the same, same thing. We don't do homeowners insurance, but we can do what's called a uh, kind of a, a force placed or uh, dwelling policy for you. If you actually have ownership interest in the property, legal ownership interest in the property, we can do a, a, a policy for you to protect that collateral for you. So in case anything happens, you don't have to rely on that. And, that, and that's actually one of my myths. I did a d different webinar <clears throat> on the 13 myths of uh, for a real estate investor. And one of those myths is that having your tenant carry renter's insurance is enough. And it, and it simply isn't. So we can certainly help you. We, we're not going to help your tenant, but we can help you. If you have actual ownership interest in that property, we can get you the right coverage to protect you. Okay, Gabriel, thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, if only the government realized that health insurance is too complex for do-it-yourself operations, they say it would have been far more successful. <laughs> Spoken like a guy in the insurance industry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I either needed agents. Yes. Yes. You need the right guy. My LLC owns it. Okay, Mavis. Got to email me if your LLC actually owns it and has an ownership interest. You can't, your tenant can't get insurance, and you don't have that asset insured. Your collateral insured. We got to talk. I can help you. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Once again, my email is Ivan at nreinsurance.com. You can find out more information at c2cria.com forward slash insurance. Bookmark it. Keep it in your contacts, whatever it is, whether you need me right now or in the future, I guarantee you, you're going to want to work with me and, and, and uh, National Real Estate Insurance Group, the, the group that I use for my personal insurance, who am I loved and with my experience in the real estate industry, understood what they do and why it was a benefit to me. And so I decided to represent them. Became, you know, my passion led me to become the, the exclusive representative for the, National, for the American Association of Private Lenders. And I mean, and that says it all, really. So I look forward to working with you. I look forward to adding value to you. This is about making sure that you have your your I's dotted, your T's crossed. You have the right thing at the right time. Let me, let me help you. And please, if I may, may be so bold, tell your friends, share this information with your groups and with your circles. And until next time, have a great evening. Thanks so much for spending your time with me. I really appreciate it. I hope this added value to you guys. We'll talk to you next time.